All right, we're, we're good to go. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to those of you in Beirut. Um, and thank you for joining today's panel on uh, the politics, economics, and regional dynamics uh, of Lebanon's power crisis. Uh, my name is Chris Abin Asif, and I'm the Lebanon Program Director here at uh, the Middle East Institute. And in today's conversation, what we'll try to do is shed way more light on a conversation that's picked up a lot of interest both in Lebanon and in DC, potentially for different reasons, uh, but it has picked up a lot of interest uh, nonetheless uh, when it comes to the Hezbollah and Iranian uh, fuel imports that have uh, started to hit the Lebanese market over the past few days, uh, as well as the US-backed uh, Jordanian and Egyptian gas and electricity proposal uh, that is still in the making and that uh, is expected to develop over the next uh, weeks and months. So it's definitely an ambitious uh, proposal or agenda uh, to cover the, both the politics, the economics, and the regional dynamics, but I think we can cover some, uh, some significant ground over the next uh, 60 minutes we have together. Uh, today's panel falls within the broader uh, programming at MEI that's dedicated uh, to advancing the mission uh, of the Institute, uh, which is, if, if some of you are not familiar with it, to increase knowledge of the Middle East among uh, the citizens of the United States and to promote a better understanding between the people uh, of these two areas. So to help us do this, given how uh, intersectional really this conversation is, uh, I'm really pleased to be joined by three experts uh, that are, I just realized uh, all three of them are affiliated with the Middle East Institute in one way or another. So first I'm happy to introduce Jessica Abed. Uh, Jessica is an independent energy policy consultant advising international organizations and uh, governments on electricity and energy transition. She's a non-resident scholar with the Lebanon program, as well as with uh, the newly established energy and economics program uh, here at MEI. Next, we have Renda Slim, Islim, uh, who's the director of the Conflict Resolution and Track to Dialogues program, also at the Middle East Institute, uh, as well as a non-resident fellow at the Johns Hopkins School, uh, at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced and International Studies, SAIS, uh, Foreign Policy Institute. So uh, Jessica, Renda, thank you for joining. Uh, and then finally, we're uh, lucky to also be joined by Ishaq Diwan, uh, who is a professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics uh, and the École Normale Supérieure. Uh, he was previously a regional economist at the World Bank's uh, Middle East Division, as well as a country director uh, for Ethiopia and Sudan, uh, followed by Ghana, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. Uh, and then he also served as a director for Africa and the Middle East at the Center for uh, International Development uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, so like Jessica, uh, Ishaq is also a non-resident scholar, both with the Lebanon program and with the energy and economics program at MEI. So again, thank you for the three of you to, to being here with us. And I really look forward to uh, our conversation. And to our audience, thank you uh, for your trust and thank you for dialing in as well. If you would like to submit any questions at any point, please feel free to use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Uh, if you have any issues, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, also email events at mei.edu and our team will uh, respond to you or channel your questions to us here. Uh, and then one last plug before we begin, I would uh, love to invite you to a book talk uh, that the Lebanon program is hosting next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, with Sharif Majdalani, who's a Lebanese French uh, writer, uh, to discuss the recently published translation of his book, uh, Beirut 2020, Diary of the Collapse. Uh, that's next Wednesday at 1 p.m. And our team uh, in the conversation will uh, also share that uh, announcement in the chat. Uh, so let's let's maybe kick this off directly with you, Jessica, to kind of uh, provide a context and really ground this conversation to bring everyone uh, up to speed really quickly. I think, or I at least assume that people are familiar with what's been happening over the past few weeks. Uh, so can you maybe just very, very briefly explain to us why this power sector in Lebanon has been so problematic for the past 30 years, plenty of reasons, but just a very quick overview to, to, to kind of ground the conversation uh, before really digging into an assessment uh, of the Hezbollah updates, but also the uh, Egyptian Jordanian proposal uh, when it comes to feasibility and then when it comes to how much it will be able to meet uh, market demand in Lebanon, given uh, the crisis right now. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, so Lebanon hasn't had any kind of reforms in the power sector for almost three, uh, three decades, as, as you've mentioned. Um, in Lebanon, there are major technical problems, financial problems, and I'll go back later to the roots for this. So the technical problems are rather simple to solve. So uh, there is a shortage in power generation capacity of almost at least 1,600 megawatts. There are high technical and non-technical losses, technical losses, uh, which is the weak grid. Uh, we have non-technical losses in terms of non-billing, 
there are so many consumers who have never received the bill. The billing is almost 60% of the consumers, but also non-collection uh, and illegal uh, connection. Uh, but uh, when we look into this, there is also a very high cost of power generation and cost of recovery for the electricity. So the cost of power generation is almost $16 cents per kilowatt hour. It should be less than nine cents. And the, the reason for this is that Lebanon consumes and uses for power generation heavy fuel oil and diesel oil, which are very expensive, heavy pollutant fuel. This has, should have been switched to natural gas a long time ago, but this doesn't happen. There have been so many plants that have never been implemented. Uh, the switch to natural gas would have saved heavily uh, on fuel prices, especially before now, because now the natural gas prices are soaring, but this never happened. Uh, when we add to the losses, technical and non-technical losses to this cost, we end up with a cost higher than $24 cents per kilowatt hour. That's very important to mention because you cannot have a thriving economy when you don't have affordable electricity. And also because of the, because of the gap in power supply, uh, residents of Lebanon have to also rely on private diesel generators of which the cost of the tariff is almost $30 cents per kilowatt hour. So when we all add all this, the consumers who are paying two electricity bills, they have been in public debt because, because the, uh, the power utility has been bankrupt for the past three decades. The cost of uh, the power sector has been $40 billion on public debt. We add the power, lower purchasing power of the citizens who have to rely on two electricity bills and the low competitiveness of businesses because of the high cost of diesel generation as well. Uh, and you have high environmental impact and uh, health damage because of the diesel and pollutant fuel. So when we add all of this, uh, we end up with all this mass in the power sector. Uh, this seems complicated, but Lebanon is not trying to discover electricity. Of course, so Lebanon needed to, to implement two thermal power plants a long time ago, maximize reliance on domestic natural resources, which are renewable energy, and Lebanon has abundance of renewable energy uh, sources. Uh, Lebanon should have switched to natural gas and improved collection and billing uh, and had the authority to reduce illegal collections through smart meters or so. So the solution, technical solutions are very simple. And even before the financial crisis and Lebanon's default like 18 months ago, we haven't seen actual reforms and no technical solution or financial solution to the power sector. And this brings me to the system uh, in Lebanon, which is built on power sharing. So after the war, the system was kind of built to ensure that all the major powers are sharing uh, powers and nobody had any kind of interest to invest in, in kind of any armed conflict, which meant that throughout the years, all these polit major political powers had so many vested interests across the value chain in the power sector, whether in fuel, uh, fuel imports and distribution, the proliferation of diesel generators, which is an illegal economy, informal economy, but it's valued at around $2 billion in terms of diesel imports, replacement of generators, maintenance of generators, and uh, provision of generators. And you have uh, the procurement, sectarian procurement. Every time the power utility needs to do anything, they need to have one for the Shiites, one for the Sunnis, one for the Christians uh, with the corruption schemes and all. Uh, so we ended up in nowadays with all this cost and citizens per, buying for two, paying for two electricity bills and then end, ending up with huge power outages. And then this kind of, you know, clearly feeds into the current crisis that we're in, right? So these decades of mismanagement and, and, and corruption in a way. Uh, and then this absence, right? This, uh, this really severe shortage of, in electricity and power generation capacity led us to effectively these, these two proposals. Uh, one of them is actually being implemented as we speak and has been for, for a few days. So can you just comment a bit on the scope of what we're dealing with right here with uh, the power generation? Hezbollah started importing these uh, fuel tanks that uh, docked in Syria and then uh, had, had transferred across the border to, to the Lebanese territory. Uh, so can you comment on the, on the, when we, if we were to talk numbers about uh, how long is this going to last? Uh, can they meet market demand, et cetera, be it from the Hezbollah angle, but also from the uh, potential gas and electricity deal that will come from Jordan and, and Egypt? 
So what we've seen across all the three decades was no sustainable electricity policy or plan for Lebanon. We've seen quick fixes across all the years, especially within the past 15 years. So we've, we've seen power barges because we cannot wait to have electricity, more power barges, other plans. Now we're talking about these quick fixes. So there has never been a sustainable solution for Lebanon. And a sustainable solution should have at the core a better governance structure and better governance indicators because it's not a technical problem, it's not a financial problem, it's just a governance problem. And the governance indicators have never actually been improved, neither in terms of procurement uh, or appointment uh, of staff, uh, having a regulator, uh, having better engagements with the private sector or building citizens' trust and transparency. We're also not seeing any of these indicators nowadays. So we're seeing all these quick fixes. So first, I want to say that it's important to keep the power on because the power sector crisis could develop into a major humanitarian crisis and ha it could have huge imp negative implications for the economy. So we need to have to keep the uh, Jessica, we lost you, I think, with the audio. Can you can you just try again? Is it working better now? Yes, back back to normal. Okay. Things is where my earphones. Um, so Lebanon needs to develop a sustainable electricity policy, which would have at its core optimizing the reliance on natural resources and the provision of the least cost electricity because we cannot have a thriving economy without this. And we need to reduce the outflow of dollars necessary on fuel imports. But meanwhile, we still need quick fixes. However, when we talk about these quick fixes in terms of quantifying this and talking about figures, uh, so Hezbollah has promised their constituents and Lebanon that they're going to provide diesel for private uh, generators provision. And we've seen a tanker offload in Syria. So the total, total amount that has been smuggled into Lebanon in a way uh, is kind of 4 million uh, liters of diesel. The demand in Lebanon is almost 5 million liters per day when EDL is supplying, when the electricity, national electricity utility is supplying at least 12 hours of electricity per day. So this would be complemented with private diesel generators of an amount needed of 5 million liters. Uh, but EDL is not supplying even seven hours per day. So when we, when we compute this, we find that uh, the shipments of Hezbollah from Iran would actually meet the demand of 40% of the private diesel generators in one day. So that's not that's not a lot. That's not much. That's barely anything. Um, and we don't know how many shipments we're going to have, right? So the, this is not the kind of sustainable solution that they can maintain forever. On the other hand, when we talk about the natural gas imports from Egypt, first it's very important to have a switch to natural gas across the power sector. So currently we have at least half of the power generation capacity in Lebanon that could be switched to natural gas. Depends on the cost we're going to have from Egypt because we're still, we still don't know the cost of uh, how much they're going to sell us the, gas, uh, the, the natural gas. And you have to add the transit costs and so for Jordan and Syria. So we're going to have to see how much savings it would be. But since Lebanon has never invested in infrastructure, uh, so we're going to use the Arab gas pipeline, which goes through Jordan, Syria, and reaches uh, Tripoli in the north of Lebanon, which would feed only one power plant that could be switched to natural gas. It's Deramal. If Lebanon did invest in a coastal pipeline, it's, so this natural gas could have flowed across other power plants and fed the industries as well. Uh, but this hasn't been completed. Uh, so at this current stage, it could only feed one power plant in Deir Amar, uh, which has a capacity of around 465 megawatt. This would add, uh, at, this would increase supply by five hours a day from EDL. Currently, it's less than seven, seven hours. The Iraqi fuel is also a quick fix, unsustainable, it has a shady deal, very untransparent. We don't know how the Lebanese government is is planning to pay, to pay if they're ever going to pay. Uh, the swap deal because Iraq fuel, the heavy fuel oil that Iraq is, is 
given to Lebanon is has high sulfur content. It's very low quality, and also Lebanon uses low quality for power generation. It's still the part the fuel we use has lower sulfur content, so it has to go through a swap deal through a third entity, which is another shady thing. We, Lebanon would end up with lower amounts, but this should add a uh, power generation of around eight hours. And then uh, I, I forgot to mention in the Arab gas pipeline, some of the technical issues is that uh, through the pipeline in Syria has been damaged throughout the crisis and the conflict in Syria. So that needs rehabilitation of around two, three months. And then there's the electricity imports from Jordan, which would also go through the interconnection grid from Jordan through Syria to Lebanon and reach the Bekaa and Lebanon through the Xara substation, which could only sustain around 200 megawatts and needs rehabilitation. Also the transmission grid due to the conflict in Syria would need rehabilitation and reinforcement as well. And then would get around 200 megawatts, which would add a bit less than three hours. So in total, Lebanon would get increased supply of uh, a power supply from the national electricity utility of 15 to 16 hours, all of which is not sustainable because now the primary issue of Lebanon is not where to provide fuel or electricity from, but how Lebanon is going to afford to finance any of this. That's very clear, Jessica. And I think it's also a perfect segue to go to you, Ishaq, but just to make sure I, I summarize it like in, in a sentence. Uh, so we're saying that the Hezbollah shipments effectively, in the best case scenario, one shipment would effectively cover the needs of the market, uh, 80% of the needs of the market for one. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. was the current power cost. Okay, so unless ships keep docking daily, effectively, this is uh, not going to be there. The Egypt and, and, uh, and Jordan uh, plan, we're looking at at least two to three months as the technical kind of grid ends up being fixed and make sure that the rehabilitation of the plants are uh, there. But both of these are effectively... Uh, well, potentially not the most cost efficient, but also not sustainable in the longer term. Although a lot of people may argue, right, that at this stage, when your head's underwater, you just take everything to survive, right? Uh, and I'm going to discuss this in a second with you, Renda, because there's plenty of geopolitics also happening in, on that front. Um, on the You talked a lot about governance as well, Jessica, just an input. Uh, uh, the program is releasing a piece next uh, week by Ali Ahmad, uh, Jamal Sarir, and, and, and their co-authors to kind of tackle this governance aspect and how to think of that massive conversation is well happening. So uh, if people are on the call are interested, keep an eye out for that next week. Uh, and, you know, it was how uh, Jessica kind of uh, handed it over to you perfectly well in terms of, you know, is the problem really a matter of we can't get our act together to get electricity and figure out technical solutions? Or is it more rooted in some of these more macro financial considerations, right, of, of the crisis? So first of all, any comments on what Jessica had to say? And then maybe if we can dig slightly deeper into the economics and finances of uh, such a deal that is the um, Egypt uh, Jordan deal, and how how you think about these uh, types of transactions or potential deals for uh, looking forward. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I think Jessica explained it beautifully, and uh, I must say I'm not an expert in, in gas and oil. Uh, you know, since I was World Bank country director, uh, I'm good at the envelope calculations and getting a feel. For kind of from above for the issues. So uh, perhaps what I can add to Jessica is that the, the real problem of Electricité du Liban, the, the, the national producer, is the losses it makes. You know, it produces at very expensive cost and it sells cheaply, subsidizes energy. And so it makes losses, it makes losses of one to two billion dollars a year, which which come largely from the treasury. So when these subsidies become smaller, the state cannot afford to, to subsidize the whole bill, uh, then the L has to ration electricity and produce more, only up to how much it can actually afford to subsidize. And so as a result, uh, there are shortages and the private generators uh, do, uh, you know, fill, fill the rest of demand at extremely high cost, even higher cost than the, the high production cost of, of the L. So that's, that's the current situation. Now, uh, you know, the deals we're talking about, especially the, the, the pipeline bringing natural gas, fits into the long-term plan of improving the air's production. You know, they would produce cleaner and cheaper. Now, how much? And that's the problem. Uh, not much. I calculated more or less the gains. You know, if the whole sector moves to, you know, the plan of ODL is to, is, to, is to produce electricity for the whole country and to shift it to gas. And if, if that's done, the gain would be about 20% less in energy cost. 
Now, given that the deal only covers 20% of overall production, you know, one site at the Amar, uh, this, this adds up to about $50, $50 million saving a year, which is not bad because this is every year for, for many years to come. But per year, it's only $50 million. Given that we, we, we really are in a crisis, in a liquidity crisis, it's not much. Now, are there more gains? Possibly, uh, it is not clear whether in that project the fuel will be paid by Lebanon or the World Bank. I would assume it will have to be paid by Lebanon uh, and, and only guaranteed by the World Bank. But let's be very generous and let's imagine that the World Bank would actually pay for one year of gas coming in. I estimate the value of that gas at about $400 million. Uh, the Iraqi deal is reportedly to be a gift of about three to four hundred million dollars. And if you kind of do back of the envelopes, and I don't know if Jessica agrees with me of uh, the Hezbollah shipment, uh, every boat is about 20 million dollars uh, of fuel, of diesel. Now, it's not clear that this is grant, right? It's going to be paid, uh, sold in Lebanon, but let's assume it's a gift. So if you add it all together, in terms of liquidity support, that's not bad. It adds up to 800 million plus, uh, you know, close to a billion dollars. And now the question is, what uh, what to do with this uh, with this this liquidity support? There are really two possibilities: either subsidize the sector so that energy prices don't have to to escalate as you know subsidies are removed from the central bank uh, are removed, uh, or support the currency. And these are very, two very different scenarios and we don't have a sense yet from the government which they would follow. If they subsidize the sector, then we will remain uh, with the current kind of crisis management situation with corruption, contraband, shortages, rationing, speculation, hoarding, uh, all of that. Uh, I doubt that the World Bank would agree on this. So, so possibly we'd see some kind of uh, you know, transition out of the current prices to higher prices of electricity. Um, and uh, really, if it's not part of an overall recovery plan that's credible, that will be a waste of resources. The other alternative is to use this billion to, to, to reduce uh, the, the impact on the exchange rate. You know, the exchange rate, as we know, has already massively devalued. So if the subsidies on energy are removed, which the, basically energy is now priced or was priced a month ago or so at 1,500 liras to the dollar. If we go to 15,000, you know, that's 10 times more. Uh, energy prices at 10 times more would be you know, a terrible blow to the economy, which has already shrunk, but by 40%, because local demand has shrunk and because firms are unable to move their production to export because the banks are closed. Actually, if you look at recent data, investment has collapsed by 70%, and exports have not taken advantage of the devaluation. Actually, they have been reduced by 50%. Because there is no liquidity in the market, firms cannot produce and shift their production to, to exportable. Now, um, if you remove the subsidies, which were $5 billion, out of total import of $15 billion, um, we're talking 2020, 2021, 15 billion a year, down from 30 billion in 2018-19. Imports have collapsed by, by half, but of the 15 that were left, 15 billion, five were subsidized. So if you push all this to the market, the exchange rate would devalue even more. Now, of course, demand will, will fall because prices are higher, so it's not the full amount, but still we would expect even more devaluations and that would raise energy costs even more. Now, compared to this 5 billion, adding in a billion is, is not insignificant, especially if demand is reduced. So that, that, would, that would perhaps make more sense or some kind of mix of uh, supporting the exchange rate and keeping some subsidies at least for a while uh, now, I must stress, in conclusion, I can develop that later, that really the exchange rate depends much more on expectations than on fundamentals now. So we must really ask ourselves, uh, what would the government do to, to regain the confidence of the market? You know, the market is expecting a lot of inflation, devaluation in the future. 
would the overall plan reinstill some confidence, some, uh, some credible confidence in the future? And perhaps for what we're talking about, what exactly are the various reforms and deals that we're seeing in the energy sector, what do they signal? And what do they do to confidence and therefore to the exchange rate? Because really, uh, the, the, the main goal of this government uh, the, the should be to, to, to improve expectations so that uh, the, 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 the devaluation is less uh, and therefore uh, import is, is cheaper and, and uh, the pain uh, of the population uh, in terms of you know, rise, rising prices, but also cost of energy, uh, the competitiveness of firms is improved. And the key to that is what happens to the exchange rate and therefore to expectations. Very clear. And do you think, as Hawk, in this case, are we looking at you know, the temporary fix that Jessica mentioned, right? The six month or 12 month or whatever the next period uh, looks like in terms of it being a stopgap or a plug uh, kind of in uh, you know, the humanitarian crisis, et cetera. Uh, but then beyond that, right, looking further out on, you know, the sustainability of, of, of this crisis, right? Jessica mentioned something in the, the sphere of or in the range of dozens of billions of dollars of losses, right? And all of that ended up feeding into uh, sovereign debt. Uh, so looking ahead beyond whatever this might look like, right, over the next six months for both deals. And again, I'm going to shift to you, Renda, in a second for, uh, for how these kind of actually develop. How do you think of funding of these projects, right? Is this something that the state... Uh, takes over is this something that ends up being channeled to the public sector uh, so how does this form you know fit within the broader sphere of reform when we go past these next six months or next 12 months or whenever the funding for uh, this particular uh, project ends or expires or the money runs out etc uh, so how do you think about the longer prospects longer term prospects of this i think there are two elements to this question there is the investment and there is the the, the price of fuel uh, you know the 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 if we have a coherent reform strategy for the sector, as we have on paper, and if, as Jessica said, the governance of the sector improves, then much of the additional capacity and cheaper and cleaner capacity and natural resources can be developed by the private sectors through, through IPPs. So the investment cost will not have to come from the budget. Now, this pro produce electricity that's cheaper in dollars uh, the problem is that the dollar is very expensive. So that alone is not sufficient to have the beginning of sustainability or recovery of the economy. It would make the recovery uh, more, uh, more, 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 more efficient, if you like, or faster if it comes. But for that, we still need a macro recovery plan that is coherent. And without it, even... Uh, cheaper energy, more efficiently produce is totally out of reach. I mean, we're, we're talking of an increase in price. If we go from 1500 exchange rate uh, to, to, to 15,000 of 10 times, this is a major shock coming into an extremely depressed economy. So uh, if we don't have a credible macro plan, these little fixes will end up subsidizing the sector for a little bit longer. And, and that's, totally unsustainable. It could take us up to the elections at best, uh, but, but with no, uh, probably the signal in term of, uh, the signal will probably be perceived quite negatively by the market. This is a sign that we are not engaging actually in reform. And I would expect in parallel, a further depreciation of the exchange rate. Very clear. Thanks, Asad. Very A lot of parallels with what we discussed on last week's panel as well. And thank you again for grounding this because it's often in the news, it's often headlines, uh, but it's often also removed from this broader macro context of you know the holistic political economy of reform generally speaking so uh, important to also highlight these uh, Renda, let me also talk you know turn to you in terms of from the lebanese perspective right it's pretty clear that you know lebanon's gasping for air gasping for power um, can you walk us through very briefly briefly maybe actor by actor involved be it jordan uh, Egypt, Syria, uh, Iraq potentially, but uh, leading up to the US and Iran, in terms of what are these players thinking, what's on the agenda, what are the incentives effectively behind this deal, uh, and how do you see these effectively evolving over the coming weeks? Hi, uh, thank you very much for having me on this panel. It was really great listening to Jessica and Ms. Haq uh, talking about these important dimensions of the power crisis in Lebanon. Uh, you know, when I look at the three plans that were we have been discussing the Arab gas pipeline as well as, I mean, the natural gas from Egypt, the electric, electricity imports from Jordan as one plan, 
the Iraq Lebanon fuel convoluted deal somehow as a second plan. And then the Hezbollah shipment of tankers from Iran as a third deal. And if I use the two criteria in evaluating which deal you know, fares better, and these two criteria that I have put are sustainability. And then two is what impact does each deal have in terms of shoring up whatever is left of the fabric of the state? of the Lebanese state. And definitely, I mean, it's clear based on what Jessica said on the technical aspect, as well as Ishaq on the economic financial aspect, none of them are sustainable in the long term, right? Without some kind of macro structural, uh, especially the Arab gas pipeline, it's going to take a long time to put together. And then the gas issue, I mean, the price issue and all this. But at least in terms of the impact of each plan on its ability to, um, to shore up, again, whatever is left of the state fabric, then I would give the highest score to the Arab gas pipeline and to the electricity imports. Because after all, the main negotiator is the government. You know, things have to go through government institutions. And that, I mean, maybe staff will need to be hired, agreements need to be inked by the government. And, and that is definitely a much better, I mean, an improvement on, let's say, the Hezbollah tanker deal, which is very much going through a non state institution, although, you know, for practical reason, Hezbollah has become l'état c'est moi, you know, the state is me. But, but still, it's still a non-state actor uh, that is importing uh, fuel from a country without the approval of the Lebanese government and, uh, and bringing it. Okay, it's not sustainable. It gives only 40% uh, of the daily needs of the diesel generators, uh, per, um, you know, still, in terms of PR, it is definitely a win for Hezbollah. You know, after all, people Lebanese can see tankers moving across the border. They can see, uh, you know, maybe their generators in their neighborhood starting to give them maybe two hours or three hours of extra electricity. I think in that respect, in terms of the PR game, it's definitely a Hezbollah win. However, the problem for Hezbollah is going to be the long term, as Jessica said. You know, so if it is one. One, uh, one tanker for 40% needs of a day in, on a daily basis. How many tankers are they need, going to be needing? How many tankers can they bring from Iran? And how many tankers can they ask of Iran to provide? Now, the narrative that is out there put both by Iranian as well as Hezbollah officials is that Lebanese merchants have paid for this fuel. So if there is anybody who believes that, I mean, I have a bridge to sell you, to be very honest. I, I don't think it's likely that anybody is paying for this amount of fuel, although I stand to be corrected. Also, it's, as, it's, it's, it's not likely that Lebanon will ever reimburse Iraq for the gift that Iraq gave us. So, um, so in terms of, 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 of the long-term repercussions on Hezbollah in Lebanon, I think it is a tough situation that they find themselves in. In a way, it's damned if they do and damned if they don't. I think by they drag their feet a long time to to deliver on their promise. If you have, they waited on the Iraqi deal to come through. They waited on the Lebanese government to come through, and yet you know, and then eventually they had to come in and do it. And so the question that they are, in my opinion, now facing is, okay, how long is this going to be needed? How, 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 ma how many more tankers can they ask of the Iranians given the peculiar or the specifics of the relationship that they have with, the, with Tehran and, and, and the extra care they go to in the kind of asks they make of Tehran, especially when it comes to Lebanese domestic affairs. Now, in terms of the, um, of the, of the, of the regional dimension of the different deals, uh, definitely, I mean, here I refer all the listeners to uh, three briefs, papers that MEI put starting in August 20, a paper written by Chris and Jessica. And on September 7, MEI put a two-part series on the Arab gas pipeline deal written by Chris and a piece on the Iraq-Lebanon fuel deal written by 
uh, an MEI non-resident scholar, Yisar al-Maliki, I think they, they go into, into a detail about the, the power dynamics, the geopolitical dynamics of the different deals we have been talking about. But quickly, I mean, if we look at, at um, Jordan, I think the, uh, I mean, it's clearly their interest is economic. They have excess electricity generation capacities and they need to sell this, they need income given the economic condition they are facing. And I have, to, you know, despite what's being said by Hezbollah and by the Secretary General, the deal that, you know, uh, the Arab gas pipeline deal was put forward, pushed forward by the Jordanian king with the American long before, you know, the, the, the talk about the, the tankers. So in terms of sequencing of timing uh, from uh, tankers from Tehran. Uh, in terms of Egypt, again, I think they have definitely an economic interest, but also they have an interest in cementing their role as a energy supplier in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, energy um, gas supplier. And that's, I think, that, that goes toward that. The question, as, 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 uh, as Jessica said, because, uh, and that has been the problem with Lebanon in the past, is the, the prices, you know, can Lebanon afford them? And, 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 um, and the other question with Egypt, the gas coming from Egypt, which is going to be raised in the future is, where does this gas come from? We know that much of that gas that goes through that part you know, of the pipeline you know, is Israeli origin. And so the question is going to be raised in Lebanon, is this gas coming to Lebanon? Is it, is it from Israel? That will be interesting, you know, in terms of whether this can be traced, you know, I mean, I don't think so, but we'll, we'll see. But that's going to be a political um, dy dimension that it's going to be raised as this plan becomes more practical. Right now, it's still in discussion. It's still in, you know, there are technical aspects of it. There is the rehabilitation of the different aspects of the pipeline inside Syria of the, but, but I think eventually, uh, when 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 the po politicians start focusing on it inside Lebanon, especially Hezbollah, I think they're going to be focusing on the origin of the gas. Uh, Syria, what it's going to gain from all of this, you know, it's back at, in the game. It's back at the negotiation table. You have a delegation of Lebanese ministers visiting Syria for the first time in a decade. You had a Syrian energy minister attending a meeting with other energy ministers in Jordan. You have recently visit from the Syrian defense minister to Jordan to meet with the Jordanian chief of staff. So Syria is back now in intra-regional politics. And that's part of that, you know, it can get maybe extra energy resources. It can get some money, hard currency through the wheeling fees, but especially the electricity part of it from Jordan. But really the important part for Syria is to be part in the in part at the negotiation table, it's back at the negotiation table, and and eventually its role in in having a how to say veto power over some energy supplies coming to Lebanon, you know, and what how does that can translate into the political power it would like to yield? Although I have to say this is a little bit too much exaggerated in the analysis, because the role that Syria can play in Lebanon in the future is going to be determined by what Hezbollah allows Syria to play, given the new dynamics between Syria and Hezbollah between Syria and Iran since the civil war in Syria. And so what used to be allowed or what used to be you know, accepted pre-Syrian civil war, I think is going to be less accepted by both Iran and Hezbollah in terms of Syrian role in Lebanon right now or in the future. Uh, Iraq, what's going to be the win for Iraq in this? Um, Yassar uh, in his piece about the Iraq-Lebanon uh, deal uh, really does a great job in distinguishing between what elements of the Iraqi bureaucracy, especially the finance ministry, how they see this deal versus the win or how does the prime minister Qadhimi sees this deal. I think this is a deal that gives, that benefited Mr. Qadhimi the most. Um, it is, um, he earns credits with the Iranians by supplying, you know, uh, by providing some assistance to Lebanon. And in this case also to, to I mean, definitely an assistant that's going to be viewed as, 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 uh, as um, pro 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 Hezbollah or assistance for Hezbollah and for Lebanon uh, through Hezbollah, 
uh, but also it's a win for Iraq again as part of its attempts to play a regional role, you know, through its energy resources. And so it's limited, it's not sustainable, but it's something that Mr. Kadhimi has been trying to culti cultivate as a regional mediator, as Iraq back at the table, as a regional um, uh, mid-sized uh, power. Uh, what is it for Iran? I think for Iran, it is, you know, I mean, it's again, it's, it's Iran coming to the assistance of its allies, being there for its allies, like it was for Bashar al-Assad during the war, you know, in Syria. It's there for Hezbollah because Hezbollah asks. So this is a, a this is not, this is, this is a gift from Iran to Hezbollah. And that's how it should be, in my opinion, interpreted. It's not a gift from Iran to Lebanon. It's from a gift from, Iran to Hezbollah. And in that respect, it is part and parcel of this delicate and complex relationship between Iran and, 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 and Hezbollah. Uh, the question again, uh, how does that play domestically? How does it play? I mean, definitely you have a government in Iran that's very much going to go out of its way to assist Hezbollah or to deliver on whatever Hezbollah asked. But also it is going to be, I think, difficult for Hezbollah to continue with these asks, you know? And that's, that's the problem that Hezbollah is facing today. So it's a short term, maybe PR win. It can sustain maybe two tankers, three tankers, four tankers, but then how many more tankers can they expect the Iranians to deliver? And that's, 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 the, the, that's a tough situation they are in. For the US, I think pushing for the Arab gas pipeline uh, deal as well as the electricity imports from Jordan, I think the benefits is to put this sector in Lebanon on a more sustainable basis, you know, especially if it were to shift to gas generation. It is addressing a humanitarian situation, as Jessica said, if power stops, it's going to be a human, you know, the, the implication on a humanitarian level are, are humongous, already adding to the woes that the Lebanese are suffering from due the, to, the, to, the, to the shortages that they have been dealing with for some time. Uh, and it is also, you know, making, I mean, integrating Lebanon more and more or counter, counterbalancing um, the shift that Hezbollah keeps to bring Lebanon toward more the east and, and more pushing Lebanon into the Arab neighborhood project, you know, like Iraq now is, is, is being pushed into more and more and supported more into, into getting back into its Arab neighborhood and being integrated more into its Arab neighborhood. I think the Arab gas pipeline, again, put Lebanon and integrates Lebanon more into its Arab neighborhood around from, uh, from this push by Hezbollah toward Iran. I'll stop. Hey, yeah, I, I want to go back to you, Jessica, and talk with two questions that I think are critical to address. But before that, since we're in context, Randa, just a quick word potentially on what does this mean when it comes to, you know, the, the Caesar Act uh, sanctions against Syria effectively? Do we expect or do we, you know, what, what could effectively happen on that front? Uh, we've seen, you mentioned Lebanese, uh, you know, not necessarily approving uh, the, gas, the, the Iranian effectively diesel, but they didn't denounce it either right so there's this kind of uh, the government is like stuck in the i mean understandably i guess uh, given given where we are right now but uh, how do you see how do you read the potential impact when it comes to the sanctions and what will or what could the us potentially do on that front will it let it go will it up its pressure will it just disregard so what are your what's your read on that quick because i think we are getting close to the end of this and i want to give time for ishaq and jessica to answer your questions so far the the what we are reading from the senate foreign relations recently you know what senator menendez said during the confirmation hearing for uh, assistant secretary ambassador leave is that they are open to discussing this you know given the arrangements and uh, and as long as lebanon can say we did not request this as long as this is being said as a initiative between Iran and Hezbollah financed by Lebanese merchants, whether these Lebanese merchants eventually will be sanctioned, you know, uh, it would be interesting if there are such Lebanese merchants as being claimed by, uh, by Hezbollah and Iran who are really buying this from Iran. Uh, I think so far the, the signaling from the US, uh, whether it's the US ambassador or the US Congress is that if these how to say, if there is a fig leaf preserved, you know, if there is a fig leaf kind of arrangement that suits everybody, given the impact of, 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 of 
total collapse of the power sector on the humanitarian situation. I think they are willing to let it go. However, the question is, okay, if this becomes, so how many tankers are we going to let this go without starting to have some pushback from inside the uh, US, uh, you know, uh, political uh, arena? Uh, I don't know. I mean, if we are going to see, you know, I mean, we might be willing to let it go maybe for three tankers, four tankers, five tankers. But if this becomes a trend, you know, how does this, how long before you are going to have more and more Republicans in Congress saying, hey, what is this? We need to examine this. Who is importing this? Who is involved in this? Where is the you know, money coming from? And all. So I think potentially it might create headache, but the fact that there is a president set, i.e. You know, the US government accepted the first tanker, is going to accept the second tanker, it's going to accept the third tanker. It's going to be hard to make the case for not accepting more tankers once the president is set. But you know, definitely it's going to be raised once, once, once. Um, you know, um, I think attention turns more and more to Lebanon. Uh, in the if attention turns more to Lebanon, I think you are going to see sectors in the Lebanese Congress. I mean, in the U.S. Congress, raising question about this. But so far, you know, it seems like it's going to be a go if we can keep the fig leaf that is present today. Thanks, Linda. Clear. And Jessica, I'm going to field to you the question of Ali on kind of, you know, shielding and minimizing the pain effectively for the uh, for effectively citizens that are crumbling under under the weight of the crisis. But before I, I do that, I want to go to you as Hawk. I mean, drawing on your experience, having been a country director at the bank, etc. Obviously not speaking on behalf of the bank, but knowing kind of how conversations tend to happen, right, when it comes to funding, when it comes to working with this government that the world, the bank itself called or labeled as causing a deliberate depression in a way. So how, how does the thinking evolve on that front? Uh, what are potential options when it comes to the funding component of the deal? How, how much do you think could come from the World Bank, from other sources? So how, how is the World Bank, or broadly speaking, just international financial institutions or partners uh, thinking about effectively finding a way out uh, for this uh, AGP uh, kind of uh, development? So how, how would you think of that, really? Good question, Chris. Uh, I must say I haven't talked to bank management about that, but the way I imagine their, their response, uh, and, and for me to end on a positive note, is that there is actually a silver lining to, to, to this deal. I mean, it, it does open, actually, a window of opportunity to, to fixing the sector. And the World Bank and other potential supporters would demand that. Uh, uh, in, in order to put uh, funding to continue subsidize a little longer the, 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 the sector uh, in ways that, that achieve some kind of soft lending. So that's a, we, we know you, we use uh, uh, initially the, the, the Iraqi gift, uh, then in, in six months, if everything goes well, uh, the pipeline has been fixed, the electricity grid has been fixed. Uh, Deals have been signed with guarantees. You know, Egyptians have to make sure that, that, that uh, the gas will be paid. Uh, there need to be agreements on prices and stuff like that. Uh, accounts are open. If, if all that proceeds, uh, you know, then uh, within a year, we may find ourselves with, with energy produced at, at, at perhaps 20 cents. Uh, and, and this could be a real game changer. I mean, if the government can do all this, and improve the governance of the sector. That is a game changer because after all, this is a sector that accounts for perhaps 40% of, of government debt. It's a big part of the problem. Uh, and so, you know, that, that is the silver line that, that this, uh, the reforms proceeds. The World Bank gets involved with heavy conditionality. We all know the problem. You have now to fix it, to take decisions. Um, and, and at the end of that process, during that process, energy is subsidized in various ways. Uh, the subsidies fall as uh, production capacity is, is rebuilt uh, and, and the sector becomes more efficient and cheaper. Uh, so it's able to, to, over time, replace the very expensive generators and perhaps produce at something around 15 cents. Uh, if, we have 15, if we start having 15 cents EDL within a year, a year and a half, uh, and I think the signals that such... Uh, 
such such a reform program uh, would, would, would provide would, would also stabilize the exchange rate, then we can imagine a soft landing. That's the positive scenario that I think the World Bank and its supporters would want to try to achieve with, with this, to really anchor uh, the Miati government reforms on that sector, where he can do perhaps more than on the financial sector at this stage. Uh, but by so doing, show also the, the credibility of, of, of the reformist part of, uh, of the regime or of the political class, and by so doing, also affect expectation on, on the bigger picture of where Lebanon is going. Thank you, Sag, very clear. Uh, and then Jessica, you know, building on what was raised in the Q&A, but also just broadly speaking, well, first, the first component is now that effectively subsidies are lifted, right? Uh, what are the potential mechanisms that are in place to uh, minimize the pain and shield effectively low uh, income households, which have become the majority effectively uh, of the population right now. And then uh, kind of piggybacking off this question as well, you know, thinking ahead, are, have we exhausted all of the short term solutions that we have? Are the deals that are on the table the only short term solutions that we have to deal with? Uh, you know, while we wait for this chain of thought or chain of events that this hawk has laid out? Well, subsidies are being lifted except for EDL so far on all fuel, except for the fuel that's being provided by EDL. But as per Ali's question, um, the more outages you have and the less supply from EDL means a reduction of subsidies and, uh, and cost burden of EDL. But that's a terrible thing to do because it means that the cost is being borne by all the citizens and businesses and eventually the economy, which would mean that so many small businesses and micro businesses are going to be outside, not only the grid, but also outside the generators because they can no longer afford it. It would uh, mean so many businesses out of business, so many consumers out of the generators network and out of EDL. So it's it's very detrimental um, to the economy, but what we're seeing is not that the government is very worried about the well-being of the of the citizens. Sadly, uh, in terms of reform, I would believe that the government is on track for serious reforms when they start addressing the governance issue and setting clear mandates and responsibilities for institutes. For example, the Ministry of Energy is the one that currently do, does the procurement. A ministry's task should never be to actually do the procurement, but to set to set the policy and the vision of the sector. So when there's an actual entity doing transparent procurement, and by transparent, we don't just necessarily mean opening the offers, making the offers public, but also in terms of how the, the bid is written, making the tenders available, the contracts and agreements available, having chains of communication with the public to build the trust because the citizens at some point, all these measures are actually very painful for the citizens. If the citizens are not going to um, to believe in any kind of reforms, they're not going to align behind the state. Um, and a key thing would be to appoint a regulator that's independent with full mandates, um, unlike what we're seeing now where uh, there's a hold of the entire power sector uh, with the Ministry of Energy. And some of the issues and some of the things that should be done and could be done now would bypass the political bottlenecks and would have been should have been done forever is uh, at any point that the electricity utility is generating electricity, it's, it's losing a lot of money. So one thing to reduce this and uh, to provide, to keep the powers on would be to decentralize the power sector. And I don't mean by each entity getting its own power plant, but to encourage renewable energy integration. It could be microgrid because Lebanon has a proliferation of generators. So it could be hybrid systems of solar connect, hybrid models connected to the diesel generators, which would reduce the reliance on the national utility, the bankrupt national utility, and would reduce the reliance on the generators and diesel for generators. So it's some of the things. Uh, a setup funding should be a green investment facility should be in place uh, to encourage productive sectors to go towards these solutions because at all costs, at all times, this is going to remain expensive electricity. So if they do implement solar with their on-site diesel generators, they're going to, to reduce their operating costs and enhance their competitiveness. So we need to think of the power sector not as a, just a sector by itself, but it's a sector that has economic, humanitarian, and political implications. And distributed, so as, 
I do not expect serious reforms or efficient reforms unless there is a change in the political structure and the political powers in Lebanon. But until this happens, a change of governance from more centralized, only centralized focus to, towards more distributed uh, energy systems would actually bypass all the political bottlenecks. Thanks, Jessica. I appreciate uh, the clarifications. Before I go for the final round of very, very quick uh, questions, I think it's worth kind of getting your thoughts on this as hop when it comes to the recent allocations of the special drawing rights to Lebanon from the IMF, slightly north of 1 billion, combining this one and whatever was residual from the last time. Um, is this a potential source of, fun, uh, of financing for uh, you know, whatever plan may come uh, when it comes to importing gas and electricity? Or what do you perceive, again, not a huge amount of people that tend to perceive this as you know a massive amount in the broader scheme of things, but regardless, it's a liquidity injection into the system. So, what are your thoughts on the use of it, be it for the power sector or uh, or any other potential uh, areas? I mean, Lebanon really badly needs dollars, so so we think. You know, the main crisis is that of, of foreign exchange, but in reality, it's not true. That's not the main problem of Lebanon. In in uh, in the in the last uh, the first nine months of 2021, uh, actually, of 2020, sorry, uh, BDL released uh, according to its own account, uh, 11 billion dollars into the system. This is more than the voluntary flows that used to come to Lebanon when they were coming, until 2019. So lots of dollars were put into the system. The, the, but not many of those ended up financing imports because imports are competing with people's demand for a store of value. They buy dollars to put it under the carpet, to send it out, uh, it's capital flight, uh, because they don't trust the system. So, you know, the billion dollar could, we could dream up of many good ways of spending it, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a drop in the world, in, 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 in the sea, if it doesn't manage to change this dynamic. So it could be spent for, for you know, subsidizing energy. It could be uh, spent better uh, for, for investing in something. It should be put in large part in the safety net so that we reduce the misery at least until something comes up. Uh, but uh, the more money you pump into, the more dollars you pump into the economy in the current condition, they would largely end up actually under mattresses as people try to rebuild their savings, which are now hostages of these banks. They can't take them out. Thanks, uh, Ishaq. And before we wrap up, you know, if I can start with you, Randa, then maybe Jessica, then uh, Ishaq, maybe in 30 seconds, uh, what are things that you're looking forward to in the next few weeks? What are red flags that you're paying attention to or potential developments that you're particularly following? So any thoughts on what you're focused on in the next few weeks? I'm interested in seeing, in, in hearing more about the narrative from Hezbollah of the tankers, you know, and indication, how long do they see this being sustained? Thanks, Linda. Uh, Jessica? Um, there's a silver lining in the gas import from Egypt because for so many years, the Lebanese officials have been, have actually they've tendered three floating and storage regasification units to switch to gas. It was once for the Shinis, one for the Shiites, one for the Sunnis, one for the Christians. But getting the gas to the north of Lebanon um, just reinforces that we just need a pipeline from the north because the power plants in Lebanon are on the coast. So you, you just need a pipeline from the north to the south of Lebanon that goes through the power plants that could be switched to natural gas and provide, uh, provide the industries with natural gas. So sh that should reduce the cost. And if the government just decides to do that, then it would be probably a good step forward. Thanks, Jessica. And also worth noting about on the Syria front, for example, an explosion took place a few days ago perpetrated by ISIS on the gas pipeline. So that just adds to the complexity of all the pipeline work that kind of transitions through the neighboring Arab countries. Um, and it's hot. Last word uh, to you. Well, I think the, the ministerial declaration was was not very clear, right? Cut and paste. Uh, just uh, we, we, with lots of ambitions, but not any precision. So uh, I think what, what we hear on the power sector in the next few weeks uh, would, would be very informative. I think it will affect a lot the exchange rate, one way or, or another. Uh, and in particular, there must be furious negotiations now between the World Bank and the government on that issue. And if nothing comes from the government, at least something will come from the World Bank. And that would provide us with a much better sense 
of whether this government has actually any muscle to do something in that sector and, and more broadly. Thanks. Important highlights, I guess, it kind of uh, pay attention to. So um, that's our time, I guess, uh, is Hog, Jessica, Randa. Thank you so much for taking the time to join. Uh, this is obviously a subject that matters a lot uh, in the U.S., but also obviously in the Levant and Lebanon in particular. So we'll keep that conversation going. Uh, thank you to our audiences for joining. Thanks for taking the time and hopefully see you uh, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, for a book talk with Sharif Majdalani about Beirut 2020. Thank you so much. Take care. Uh,